because we will also be celebrating our teenager, TJNA, 15 years. Okay, so let's take our seats. So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Thank you so much for that. So my name is Frank Kalisinje, and I'll be your host uh, for the next two final sessions. So we have the final session, which is session four, and then thereafter we shall proceed to the closing session. But before we get to uh, the final session, we would like to have some entertainment. There are some gifted people who would like to spice up uh, the afternoon. So, first of all, I will call upon Jordan Lusaka to come in front and demonstrate to us the secret that he has brought for us. And I can confirm with you, his name is really Jordan Lusaka, underline Lusaka. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, well, good afternoon, everyone. So there's, uh, there's a little bit of pressure coming to speak in front of people that actually make life-changing decisions because if you say something that is not really intelligent, they will remember you not when they're making life-changing decisions. So <laughs> bear with me as I try to settle myself down. Um, I'll be sharing some poetry with you today. And if it's all right, just to calm whatever nerves I still have within me, I'm going to do a poem that hopefully we can do together, or at least write together. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, could I have three words from someone here? Any random word, just raise your hand, say it out loud, and we can try to write a poem together. Yes, ma'am? Thank you so much. That's a very wonderful word. At least it's not too difficult. Yes? Power. Oh, that's beautiful. Great. One last word. Yes, ma'am. Integration. Integration. Thank you. I was afraid you were going to say tax because I didn't think of a way to put tax in a poem. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's prosperity, power, and integration. As we begin the rest of this session, let us remember to carry ourselves with poise, integrity, and power. We must understand that even though others may hold the instruments of power, it is up to us to use this power delicately and religiously so that we can gain prosperity for our nations. We must understand that as we carry ourselves forward, the red tags around our neck must also represent the blood shed by others who went before us. We must remember that our skin tones are not just carrying our identity, but the future generations coming before us. Thank you. Okay. I'm a little calm now. All right. <laughs> That's a, it's a great way to break the ice by involving everyone in the poem, so that if it is terrible, it's not my fault. <laughs> okay, so this is a poem uh, I wrote entitled, Lessons Learned. I learned early from my parents and grandparents that they always have a knack for being there. They're always there in the things that they taught us to do. I learned how to ride a tricycle from my grandfather. And ironically, I learned how to ride a motorcycle from my grandmother. I learned how to dress from my grandfather. He always carried himself elegantly, wearing his pants around his waist, not around his buttocks like the kids these days. I learned how to tell stories from my grandfather. He would sit me down and regale of all the, the tales that he had when he was in the unique days, carrying himself as a politician, talking incessantly for too long that I would fall asleep on his laps. And he would jerk me awake and say, hey, it's too early, you won't sleep at night. Tell me about your day at school and correct me for grammatical errors and intonation of pauses. He taught me how to capture an audience like this. My grandmother taught me how to behave. My grandfather taught me how to act, how to carry myself well. My code of conduct was raised on their teachings and ethics. In Zambia, we say, I learned ulemu, which is respect, how to treat others, not just my elders, with respect but everyone who deserves it. I learned how to speak for my grandmother. I learned how to use my voice to speak up for an injustice. She taught me to never stay quiet when something can and should be done. 
I learned bravery courtesy of my grandmother. How to honor those that have gone ahead of you. How to sit down, take lessons, learn from those that are wiser, and also to challenge the norm. I learned early that if you have a voice in a room that is not being heard, shift yourself into a room of people that are more influential, like this, and let your voice be heard so that their influence can carry what your voice cannot. My grandmother taught me never to stay quiet. My parents taught me how the world works, how to run the world, who runs the world. My parents are lovers of education. Unfortunately, as a poet, I do not exactly make them very proud being both engineers and I just a poet. But they're very widely traveled. My father taught me that exposure to things and people's way of living will show you how you did not know how certain problems could be solved simply because you don't have the knowledge they have. My mother taught me about climate change. I had my first research thesis on climate change and its effect in Zambian economy when I was in the seventh grade. It was not even presented to the school. She had me present it to her in the living room. To this day, that thesis is in the closet somewhere. I don't know where it went, and I'm not even going to say anything else about it. But my mother insisted that I must know that even though Zambia does not have any polar ice caps, as Zambians, we must be aware of the things that affect the world because they will affect our country. My mother insisted that I must be aware that climate change will affect our country, our climate, our ecosystem, our economy, and the continent. My parents taught me never to be silent. And I found myself becoming the climate change poet. I've recited at conferences in front of presidents on international soils and in schools where they didn't have proper desks. The thing is, whether we like it or not, African countries need to be at the helm of conversations battling global issues. We are the second largest continent, and yet we have the smallest voice in the things that affect us. We're the second most populated continent, and yet have the quietest voice in the things that are facing, facing global issues. Do we have all the answers? Probably not. But what we do have is a voice. We have an opinion. We have a mindset willing to learn and a willingness to change our nations. So let us take the lessons our parents grilled into us. Let us take everything our grandparents taught us so that when we are grandparents, our grandkids can say to us that they learned bravery and resilience from us. Thank you. I know we are just coming from lunch, but we can do better than that. So thank you so much, Jordan Lusaka. Um, somebody just um, talked, uh, told me that I forgot to say where I work. So I only said I am Frank Kalizinji. So I work for ETAF in the Tax Academy. Uh, so I'm not standing on, uh, in my own right. I hope I don't get fired for that. <laughs> so they say a picture speaks a thousand words. A picture speaks a thousand words. So our next artist also has an interesting name. His name is Chocolate. So next, I would like to invite Chocolate, the artist who has been actually drawing as we were deliberating for the past two days. Chocolate, you are most welcome. Uh, good afternoon, honorable ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, I would like um, to introduce myself, though he has already introduced myself, but uh, there's a connotation behind my name. I chose chocolate because of, um, it just represents uh, the African skin. Okay, yeah, and my area of expertise is um, graphics. Like I heard earlier, um, a picture can say a lot of things. So um, my job is to uh, compress complicated information into a much more uh, broken down image, which even a layman won't uh, have problems understanding. And also, um, children 
I think what, was, what is being talked about in here is very, very important in a way that we should find a way to let it trickle down even to the young ones, you know, so that they grow up knowing that we are fighting a certain system. And by, by having some simple images, we are letting even the children to grasp the important points that are being spoken here. So what I've been doing uh, since Tuesday is uh, a real-time drawing. Like every pos uh, I've been following every proceed proceeding that has been going on here, and I've been in real time uh, recording it on these pieces of canvas. So uh, I'll just go through what I've been doing. I won't go through all of them, but I'll just be picking some points that we learned. Like on Tuesday, somebody mentioned the importance of having uh, women involvement to fight corruption and illicit flows. So I had to record that. I also recorded uh, the, the point uh, of uh, eliminating colonial blockages and uh, also uh, uh, the tax justice system, accountability, simplicity, transparency, and all that stuff. So um, besides this, I'm, a, I'm an editorial cartoonist for a newspaper uh, called Diggers News, and I do uh, editorial cartoons on, on a daily basis. Yeah, so today happens to be the day I haven't done that because I had to attend this conference. And <laughs> Yeah, so um, on, uh, yesterday, there were some topics that were covered, and I, I had to do the same routine of covering from morning up to the, close, the closing time. So what, uh, what really uh, caught my mind yesterday uh, was the negative impacts of the difference, different crises we've, we've faced as Africa and how negatively it has affected us in, in terms of uh, exacerbating the debt and uh, worsening the food security, also killing the resource mobilization and, uh, you know, making tax injustice thrive. Yeah. And, and, and also, uh, this is today's canvas. So uh, I began by drawing the reflection. Don't worry, there's no, no, no one will find their faces here in case you are worried. <laughs> but if someone looks similar to you, please forgive me. <laughs> so um, we st started off by the reflections of yesterday. Yeah. Uh, where do we get, where do we get th this, this uh, where do we get it wrong? What needs to be done? Why are we not doing it? When must we do it? And then the challenges of collecting revenue are to record and the innovative ways to increase the resource mobilization. So, um, in a nutshell, I can't go through all the panels and, and the, 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 the boxes, but I just wanted to introduce myself as the artist who, uh, who breaks down information, complicated information into simpler, understandable graphic images. I'm also an animator on the other hand. So thank you very much for this platform. I would like to thank CTPD for giving me this important platform. And thank you all for your support. Thank you so much, Chocolate. That was really exciting, and uh, people are really gifted. Let's give him another round of applause. OK, now we'll move into our final session. Before I do that, I have um, uh, one announcement. Remember Francis, in the morning, he promised that if we are on time, he will give us gifts. But I don't know whether there's anybody who has gotten a gift yet. But he promised me that for him, when he promises something, he delivers. So don't worry, just relax. Ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, I would like now to invite um, the panel for the fourth and the final session of the 10th Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Taxation. But before I invite uh, our honorable colleagues, I would like to share this personal experience, which is related to the session that we are going to get into. 
The session is on domestic resource mobilization within the context of climate change. Now, climate change is a new phenomenon. And personally, I never used to be a fan of climate change. Why? I was never a fan of climate change because when you try to look at the greenhouse carbon emissions by Africa, they only stand at 3.8%. That's the whole continent. And contrast that with the global greenhouse um, emissions by China, which stand at about 23%, USA at about 19%, and the European Union at about 13%. But I was converted. I received Jesus Christ. But how did I get converted? I was converted because I realized that climate change, yes, it's happening, and Africa only, you know, is responsible for a very small percentage, but there are two main reasons that made me to change, two main reasons that made me a disciple of climate change. The first reason is climate change affects all of us. It affects us all. It does not affect those who emit a lot of carbon, um, uh, carbon emissions. No, it affects all of us. The second reason is Africa is more vulnerable to climate change. You talk about um, climate hazards like drought, floods, changes in the rain pattern. All those hazards affect us more. Because, you know, Afri uh, Africa, we are more uh, subsistence or agriculture based. Now, with these two main reasons, that's when I realized that climate change is an important topic and we really need to do something about it. And therefore, as Africa, we need to build resilience to climate change, regardless of whether we are contributing a small percentage or not. But how do we build this resilience? For us to build resilience, we need money. We need money. And where do we get the money? Sustainable money only comes from efficient and effective domestic resource mobilization. And that is why we have got this session on domestic resource mobilization within the context of climate change. Because we need the money to finance the climate resilience. We also need the money to position ourselves as Africa. So to further unpack this discussion and probably to also convert some of you to believe in climate change, we have an esteemed panel of experts who will take us through session four. And they will be led by Enea Maseko. So I call in front Enea Maseko, who is our moderator for this session, to take us through uh, the rest of the session. Uh, Enea will also call upon all the panelists who will be in this session. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Frank. Um, you've, you've made my job much easier uh, by setting the stage already. Um, it was really good to hear that someone would have come up with a poem uh, on climate change at age seven. I, I, that was quite unbelievable. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that Frank has spoken about is the need for money. And so in this session, we are going to connect climate financing um, and the ways that countries, most of the countries where we're coming from, raise money, usually by looking to the natural resources and tapping into them and raising money for development. Um, I'm Enea Maseko. I'm coming from the Zambia Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. In short, it is called EITI. I am supporting civil society, government, special implementing agencies, and uh, the corporate sector alike on uh, the implementation of something called beneficial ownership transparency. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that for those of you 
um, who might be um, uh, new to the concept. It is basically part of the standards that the EITI produces to enhance the governance of natural resources. In this case, it uh, implies disclosing information about the natural persons who are behind the corporate entities that do business in our jurisdictions, and not just in the EI sector, but across the entire spectrum of economic activity. Uh, now, uh, we've had really, really amazing panels that we have been served up with from the beginning, and I assure you, uh, this one we will not disappoint. Um, we are going to end with a bang, as Frank has, has said. Um, and so I will shortly be um, calling upon uh, my panel to, to come. Uh, but before I do that, let me just also quickly indicate, adding to um, uh, Frank's uh, uh, efforts to give us the context of this discussion, is that um, just yesterday, the CEO of, uh, of, of Rio Tinto was speaking in Perth, in Australia, and she indicated that at the moment, you have a demand of 350,000 tons, 350,000 tons of lithium, and by 2030, that number is going to go up to 3 million tons. And that 3 million tons, believe it or not, they are expecting most of it to come from our countries. So you have this demand that is growing, and this is just one example of the critical minerals, the energy minerals, the transition minerals, whatever we're calling them. There are many. So what does this mean uh, for us? And so this session that we are going to go into uh, we will focus specifically on climate change uh, crisis. We spoke about the triple crisis. Now we are zeroing in on one of them and related to resource uh, extraction and how we can balance between sustainability and domestic resource mobilization based on extracting uh, the natural resources. So we will end with a bang. We are going to end uh, like uh, um, Samkonga, Muzala Samkonga. For those of you who don't know him, ask your Zambian neighbor. Or oh, we are going to end like, uh, what's the other example I can use? Mary Mura. Uh, if you don't know her, ask your Kenyan neighbor. So I'm going to call upon the, the, a panel. Uh, two of our panelists are joining us online, um, and two are in the audience. So I have the pleasure of calling upon um, Mr. Darlington. Please come forward, uh, Darlington. Uh, Darrington Muyambwa from Sarwa, and then you are right next to the other distinguished panelists, uh, Veronica, uh, please come forward as well. And then I would like confirmation from uh, the IT that we do have our two equally distinguished panelists who are online. I see a nod, so it means that Mr. Uh, 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 Fred um, Kabanda uh, from AFDB is with us virtually, and we also have um, Ms. Uh, Viola Taros, and I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, Viola, that you are also with us. Right. Um, so the format of this session will be similar to what we've done before, but we are going to try and, uh, and maximize uh, on the time that we have um, between us uh, now and the, the 15th uh, birthday party that is coming up um, soon. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, um, I'm going to get us into this conversation uh, by inviting uh, our first speaker, and I would request that um, ITU project her uh, on the screen uh, for us to interact with her better. Please feel free, uh, those of you in the room uh, or, uh, on the online platform, Zoom, I'd like to take note of your questions. Uh, we do have limited time, but I'll endeavor to open up space for us to interact uh, with the panelists. So, Viola, um, please uh, be ready. I would like you to be the first uh, to make the submission. Uh, as uh, IT helps us to get her projected, um, Viola, a little bit about her is that she is the policy advisor on tax and extractive industries uh, at the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, um, Metals, and Sustainable Development, IGF in short. Uh, she is a trained economist uh, specializing in extractives. Um, prior to that, uh, Viola held positions um, at Oxfam, at the National Oil Corporation of Kenya, among many others that I won't go into. And so, Viola, um, I, and I hope that you've had a chance to follow the discussions that we've had 
um, up until now, since the beginning of this pack on illicit financial flows. Um, IGF uh, has conducted extensive research uh, on tax and mining. So give us your perspective on the role of uh, mining and how the revenues, especially from uh, this boom that we have just spoken about uh, associated with energy transition, if fully maximized, how these revenues can be used to fund government priorities. Good afternoon. Please confirm if you can hear me very well. We hear you perfect. Viola, please uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Anea. Um, I don't know how much time I have. I do not want to stand between you and um, the birthday party, so I'll try and keep my remarks short. Um, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Viola Tarus, uh, based in Kenya. Unfortunately, I could not travel to be with you, but thank God because of technology that I'm able to participate virtually. Um, so back to the conversation on energy transition, climate change, critical minerals. You're right that the energy transition presents an opportunity for countries to increase financial benefits from their mineral sector. Indeed, uh, because of the demand of critical minerals to fuel the energy transition, we're going to see an increase in investment in the mining sector and potentially a decrease in investment in the oil sector. Both these two sectors are very vibrant in the African economy. And we are also fortunate that we, um, the African economy, the African soil has critical minerals in plenty. Along with the energy transition, there's also the technological innovation that's going to accompany the energy transition. And with this, we are also going to see the use of green technology. We are also going to see improved technology being used in the mining sector, technology that is going to increase the safety of employees, technology that will be used to increase the extraction of resources, um, resources that initially um, were unreachable. We're also going to see technology being used by revenue administration to increase the monitoring of production, but also the collection of taxes. I also want to mention that technology will also likely go into displaced labor, that we are going to see people or um, communities looking for alternative sources of livelihood, people who were employed in the mining sector, but also from a government point, we're also going to see less payroll taxes being paid to government. For some countries like Zambia, payroll taxes contributes almost 16, 17% of taxes. And so these are some of the potential impacts of the increase in demand of critical minerals in the energy transition. My key takeaway point from all these things that are happening is that there is an opportunity to reap from the energy transition, and in particular to increase the revenues from the mining sector. But this means that we are going to do things differently. It would mean as countries um, within the African continent, as civil society, as private investors, we need to do things differently, knowing again that these resources are exhaustible. So we are looking at reforms from the fis on fiscal re regimes. We are looking at fis reforms on fiscal administration, but also looking at opportunities for value addition within our mining sector. And this is going to fully maximize the revenues that we are going to collect from the sector. It will also require prudent management and distribution of revenues to the public because all these resources belong to the citizens of a country and the government is their custodian. In terms of distribution of resources, government currently have competing needs between funding recurrent versus development expenditures, between putting this money for current use or for future generation. In my country, Kenya, we've just had our elections and the key um, top priorities right now would be to fund the drought um, that's currently ongoing, 
but also we are going to continue to see the aftermath of the pandemic. And so for our government, you, um, for governments, they need to be prudent management and distribution of revenues coming from these exhaustible resources to be used very well and to be used for the betterment of the citizens. I'll stop here. Thank you. Paola, thank you so much. Indeed, she deserves a round of applause. Lots of critical issues that you have raised. You have raised risks. You have raised the aspect of not only looking at the uh, opportunities in the energy transition, but also in terms of the technologies that come with that and the potential to raise revenue, but also some of the downsides to that as it relates to the, uh, to the, to the kind of decisions that our governments have to make in terms of allocating uh, resources. So thank you so much. We'll come back to you at some point. Uh, I would like now to turn my attention to um, Mr. Fred um, Kabanda, a kindly project him as well, IT. Um, he is the manager uh, responsible for extractives at the AFTB, um, at, the at the African Natural Resources Management and Investment Center of the AFTB. Uh, the, the division he heads is responsible for advising regional member countries on how to maximize economic benefits uh, from extractives. Um, he has supported Africa's regional integration uh, communities and several countries over the past years, including promoting uh, local content in Zambia. This I can attest to. I've been in meetings where he has been absolutely instrumental to this cause, including generating evidence to support the Zambian government on local content within the context of the mining sector. And so he's been in this field for about 30 years and he will give us a flavor of that experience he has at AFTB. Um, Fred, um, Africa's natural resources, as you've heard, oil and gas mining have not yielded meaningful transformation, economic and social outcomes. And if you've had a chance to listen to this forum, that has been one of the messages that came out. Um, what for you are the new challenges and opportunities that you're observing in Africa's mining, oil, and gas industry. And as you do that, if you could also tell us about what it is that AFTB is doing to support this very important conversation of domestic resources mobilization, in this case in relation to climate financing and the energy transition, and the, and the kind of strategic investment decisions that our, government, uh, our governments need to be thinking through and implementing. Thank you very much. Um, just a confirmation, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and greetings from Abidjan in West Africa. Uh, I just couldn't make it, but uh, it seems there is a lot of fun, and uh, I should really make the point to join you next time. I would like to thank you for the invitation uh, of the African Development Bank and uh, just to uh, respond to your question, I would like to start by setting the context with three uh, things that are really obvious, but one repeating. One, Africa is endured with natural resources, and we host 30% of all the global reserves of minerals. This is very important. Secondly, when we talk about Africa, there are variations in countries. There are some countries which are almost 100% dependent on revenue that come from the extractive resources. And three, uh, extractive will remain relevant for some time to come, despite the aspects of climate change. And as um, an estimate, the African Development Bank estimates that for the next 20 or so years, there will be an average of $30 billion per year coming in to Africa through the expansion. Now, what are the challenges? Clearly, uh, climate change comes with uh, challenges because there will be uh, reduced investments in the extractive sector, especially those that are high emitting or the fossil fuels. And this will therefore mean that the countries that were uh, receiving revenue may actually have to decline because there is no exploration 
that we will now lead with production because these are non-renewable resources. And this is true, especially because there are many countries which are using our own resources, which have targets of net zero by 2050. Pandemics and uh, geopolitics will still play a big role and will definitely continue to um, affect the revenues that come in. We saw that during the COVID-19, the revenues that had been saved in the sovereign wealth funds were nearly needed in some countries because there was a crisis and money was needed for the health sector. So we never know when these pandemics come and we may not know the next crisis after the Russia invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, one fundamental challenge that we also see uh, coming up from uh, the new uh, era that are you know, uh, going on within the extractive sector is that local content and value addition are still limited. This is an old challenge, but we need to look at it from a new perspective. And the new perspective is, if we are going to achieve uh, benefits from the climate uh, change by you know, producing our own battery minerals, how can we be able to change the trend and be able to add value? So this is still a fundamental challenge that the bank is actually working on with different stakeholders. Um, we coordinated the ERSC um, business forum last year, where uh, the two presidents of uh, um, ERA Congo and the Zambia attended, and this we presented with the emphasis of being able to add value to the battery minerals and to at least be able to produce the battery precursor. And the study we did together with our colleagues. Uh, you, uh, the African UNECA, UNECA, AU, um, and many other partners, showed that it is cheaper to produce the battery precursors in Africa by three times compared to the US. So clearly, this is something that will be done and should be done to go forward. Governance, of course, is another challenge that is persistent. It is an old story, but we need to be able to address this aspect. And I know you have beaten uh, uh, the aspects of illicit financial flows to the very uh, end, but it is important to highlight that the numbers are still high. Overall, the African Development Bank estimates that from all the natural sources, including fisheries, forestry, uh, mining, environmental degradation, we lose about 195 billion. Uh, in this area of financial flow. And for the extractive, this is estimated at 100 billion. So this is still very hard, and we must do something. What are the opportunities we see? Of course, like I have indicated, um, there are going to be opportunities from the climate change itself. Specifically, because the demand for renewable energy generation and storage, energy storage, is high, and therefore, many minerals are required. And like I indicated in the context, we are endured with such, uh, you know, minerals. And so this is uh, indeed an opportunity that we can have to, we may have to look at going forward. And so uh, the minerals in, that include cobalt, manganese, graphite, lithium, phosphates, uh, the rare earth elements are indeed very high. And we really have the domestic consumption capacity. Because, like you know, the population of Africa is growing significantly. It will double from what it was in 2020 in the, about uh, you know, few years to come. 2050, we expect to be about 2.5 billion from you know, 1.37 in uh, 2010. So there, are, there is going to be a market for this. Because even if you look at the energy alone, it will be growing the demand for energy will grow. And with population, the soils are limited, and so we must look at the resources we have in order to be able to make them produce better. And so phosphates, for instance, which are also useful in battery minerals, are going to be critical. Can you imagine that in Africa, 
uh, we use on average 17 kilograms per hectare in the sub-Saharan Africa for fertilizer as compared to a global average of 135 uh, kilograms per hectare. So this is still something that will really need to come to the minerals going forward. Of course, domestic uh, linkages is coming up and we must be able to gradually move away from these uh, non-renewable resources and, you know, create lasting values in things like infrastructure, uh, things like, you know, uh, industry that could be able to get this. And so this is indeed an opportunity. How can we increase resource mobilization? Here I would like to start, that, to start by saying that uh, Africa doesn't have to pay for yeah. COP15 COP, COP was many years ago. The one this year, next uh, month, uh, in November, will be COP27. But 100 billion was promised in COP15 and has not seen its way after that. So clearly, this is an important forum where you must be able to find what are the alternatives you have in generating your own money. And extract it is still available and can still be used. How can it be used? Local content and value addition is critical. Jobs will be created using uh, uh, extractives. We will be able to, even if uh, we brought in other partners to help us develop digital sources, at least the goods and services must be supplied by the locals and therefore increase the money that stays you know, within uh, Africa from these resources. We have seen developments moving in some countries uh, for instance, in Angola and uh, Nigeria, uh, all the marginal fields, the small fields for petroleum, are now, by law, required to be licensed only to local companies. So this is something that is, you know, ongoing. Uh, local processing will definitely need to uh, expand, and when it expands, your tax base increases as well. But we must also take advantage of some of the uh, institutions and initiatives that are in place. The uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Area is one which must work within the context of a regional cooperation. And in order to have regional cooperation, countries must speak to each other. In geology, uh, geology does not know the boundary. So if it is a um, copper, it will not know the boundary between here and and Zambia. So similarly, if uh, you know, uh, you are exploring for copper, you will find copper in the Congo and uh, you know, uh, Zambia as well, if the geographic uh, regions are crossing the coast, are uh, cutting the coast, which is very, very critical uh, going forward. Of course, talking about use, prudent use of these resources means that we must look at with scrutiny to uh, the state uh, owned enterprises. And this is critical because. Within the oil sector, many companies will leave the continent as they uh, call the resources they leave stranded. And it is these state owned enterprises that must take charge. How they manage these resources will be very critical uh, going forward. But above all this, we are also to um, continue with the domestic resource mobilization. We must uh, create environments that are enabling to be able to bring in the investment that we may not be able to afford ourselves. Governments have a lot of responsibilities. They must do health, education, and they must concentrate on those. So if we can bring in the private sector, let's do um, uh, the, provide them the required environment in order to undertake it. I will end with what we are doing at uh, the African Development Bank uh, in order to enhance this domestic resource mobilization. One is we are supporting uh, processes that add value to extractive. I have talked about our work that we have done with, uh, you know, highlighting the potential in Diara Congo and Zambia. This led to the signing of uh, an agreement of cooperation between Diara Congo and Zambia to collectively go together. And we have formed the Battery Council where we would like to uh, promote this asset going forward. Value addition will also support by lending institutions like the Lending for City Morocco to produce fertilizers for Africa. They used to export all the fertilizers 
and left the domestic market. We are currently undertaking a green mineral strategy with the, the African Union, UNECA, UNDP, and other stakeholders. We think this is critical because many other strategies that are coming from abroad are intended to continue exporting commodities. Our drive is to be able to continue exporting commodities, but after you have been able to produce domestically, and if we can be able to produce um, aspects that you know, who do uh, benefit and create more jobs, the better. We also support directly um, uh, countries that require our support through uh, projects that lead to uh, increase domestic resource mobilization. These uh, countries that come up and write projects, we are currently working with Tanzania, Senegal, Libya, South Sudan, among others. And the final aspect that I would really like to talk about that we are working on now, which is not being yet ready for serving, it is still in the kitchen, but it's something we are calling the drive for natural planet. And this is something that we would like to improve uh, going forward. And this is uh, uh, because uh, the aspects that we get to uh, remain uh, require that you are countries are rated before they are given any loan. And in the rating of these countries, there has been no consideration in the past on what uh, natural resources exist. So preservation of natural resources, if you are not going to develop your natural resources and somebody is going to lend you money, how can they change? How can we be able to put this into consideration to be able to improve you are lending rates and credit rates. This is something that we are working on together with partners because we need to integrate natural capital practices into sovereign credit ratings for Africa in order to enhance uh, our domestic resource mobilization, which will bring down the lending rates and therefore bring development uh, going forward. So, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to say natural resources will continue to play a role in building the climate transition and we can be able to build on this in order to be able to go forward with the service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Fred. I mean, you raised so many issues there. I, I was tempted on several occasions to, to try and stop you, but I think you've done a good job of giving us a sense of what is happening at continental level. Uh, particularly in terms of the strategic role that an African Development Bank can play in help us to address this tension between um, uh, extracting strategic minerals and also um, uh, meeting our obligations in as far as um, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation is concerned. Thank you so much. You touched on so many things, the role of state-owned enterprises, the AFCFTA, local content value addition, which is very consistent with the discussion we had earlier, and I'm hoping that Darlington, you can pick up on some of these points um, in terms of what Saro has been doing in the region um, to help us understand how um, uh, we can tap into um, the strategic minerals from a regional perspective. Uh, we had some fascinating conversations earlier uh, from the panelists. Um, keeping in the spirit of continental Pan-Africa, I wish to turn to um, uh, my other uh, 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 panelist, and this now is Veronica Zano from Oxfam. Um, actually, I'm standing uh, next to very good colleagues. Um, we have worked together before, so this is very comfortable for me. Um, and uh, I'm going to um, enjoy this. Um, Veronica is a regional advisor uh, on extractive industries for Oxfam in Southern Africa. Uh, previously, she has worked as a legal and policy specialist for organizations like the Southern Af Africa Resource Watch, uh, PACT, uh, ZELA, that's the Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association. Um, she is an extractive industry governance practitioner with over 10 years of wide experience in legal policy and reforms and institutional strengthening. She was working on a broad range of, or with a broad, ra broad range of actors, uh, including government institutions, regional bodies, parliaments, civil society, private sector, even local communities. So that's the breadth of experience that she has. Um, Veronica, um, now let's talk about the Africa mining vision. I think it's something that interestingly for me so far, I haven't heard us touch on 
uh, in this discussion. Um, uh, what do you see, um, uh, what, what opportunities do you see for fiscal reform uh, in the context of the Africa mining vision uh, going forward? And, and as you do that, can you also narrow it down to what should government, civil society, you know, be focusing on in terms of their efforts when it comes to DRM in relation to climate change? You can, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Enea, and uh, apologies for the techno technical glitch. Uh, it somehow is the trend that whenever it's our time to present, or my time, I always face this technical glitch, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a personal thing. So um, just following in with the discussion that our, our former, former panelists just, um, just shared, uh, we are gathered here um, at the 10th Pan-African Conference and discussing various efforts in terms of what have been the enablers and the challenges towards us effectively garnering on uh, aspects of domestic resource mobilization and more importantly for a strategic critical economic sector uh, which is the extractive industries and I think even yesterday we were talking we we're talking about the importance of having homegrown solutions that uh, speak to the contextual realities of us as Africans and what better blueprint can we speak of besides the Africa mining vision uh, that was adopted by African heads of states uh, in 2009. And surprisingly, 13 years down the line, the same issues that have been profiled by Africa mining vision in terms of some of the challenges over the years, uh, in terms of how is African governments, especially resource-rich countries, we have failed to uh, provide broad-based economic and sustainable growth for our people from our resources is still the agenda of the day even to date and more importantly now with the crisis such as the climate crisis whereby a region or a continent like ours where we have 20 of the most vulnerable countries uh, with the climate crisis being in Africa and uh, when we look at the Africa mining vision it looks at the Africa the extractive industry mainly the mining sector more broadly as a developmental sector, where the ambition of the Africa mining vision envisages a mining sector that promotes the growth of key economic sectors. And in so doing, what are some of the enablers which the African mining vision sees as key important aspects in towards uh, effective and uh, efficient collection of resource revenue? Um, importantly, I think the Africa mining vision does not just locate the issue of um, domestic resource mobilization and sustainable growth of the sector, mainly from just the fiscal narrative. But it looks at the different um, chains, um, mineral commodity supply chains, uh, which are offered as opportunities and enablers of uh, garnering of the resource rents and the revenue that is needed from the extractive industries and also other key economic sectors. So what are we saying? We are saying, in an era where we're talking of issues of critical and transitional minerals, which are going to be key in terms of uh, the production of climate smart technologies, Africa is seen as the solution towards the adaptation of climate adaptation solutions. But as African countries, we're talking about, or we're foreseeing, for example, studies by the World Bank saying there's going to be 500% increased production of minerals such as cobalt, such as copper, um, cobalt, lithium, and graphite. But how many of our countries really do have extensive geological mapping in terms of really understanding the full value and the full mineral wealth that our countries do possess? And more importantly, in terms of the scenario where we're talking about the strategic minerals, which we are all seeing is 
going to be the drivers of addressing the climate change, especially the loss and damage issues that uh, African governments have been battling around in terms of the climatic shocks and stresses that are imposed upon our nations due to the climate crisis. So the Africa, Af Africa mining vision actually locates the issues of understanding, in, investing in terms of geological mapping as a key narrative that would drive in terms of really understanding what are some of the regional uh, laws and policies that have to be put in place by countries in terms of ensuring that there is optimized mineral revenue collection from, uh, from the mining sector. And over the two days, I think this narrative has been positioned in terms of what have been some of uh, the areas where we have seen as governments lagging in terms of ensuring that we either provide tax incentives to some of uh, these corporates, also addressing issues of illicit financial flows. I think the session this morning, we also uh, did take a deep dive in terms of also understanding how even some of our governments have also been making strides to ensure that there is optimum revenue collection and maximization from uh, the mining sector. But secondly, and the most important thing that has also really been profiled in terms of this discourse has that, I think even yesterday was that the whole impetus of tax justice is to ensure that revenues that are collected, they are distributed towards the broader economic development of the society. And which speaks to the whole issue of locating the linkages of the mining sector with other strategic key economic sectors, what we call the local domestic economy. And when we look at the Africa mining vision, it was seeing this challenge way. Our continent has mainly been a commodity driver and exporter of these key minerals. And that is something that still is critical, especially at a case where we are seeing issues of transition or minerals seen as a commodity boom. But is it really a commodity boom or is it an opportunity or a trap? where the same legacy issues that have profiled in terms of the extraction of this enclave model of exporting raw materials, isn't it going to be the same discourse that is going to be even upon us as we look at the issues of the energy transition? So all these opportunities that we're talking of, of the development of climate smart technologies, as we look at right now the situation, how many of our countries are really uh, producing solar products? So... When we then talk about issues of beneficiation and local value addition, for me, I think critically are the question is, how are we maximizing on the revenues currently by the extractive industry, especially the transitional minerals and even the traditional minerals that we are mining towards investing of those key economic enablers in terms of infrastructure development, technology, uh, technology transfer and issue, in, I mean, getting into those agreements where we actually get into those agreements with companies to come and ensure that we develop those technologies in Africa. And that is the spirit and the ambition which the Africa mining had. But 12 and 13 years down the line, it is still the narrative that we are still exporting. We are still talking of a strategy towards working on the critical minerals, yet other countries have been far ahead of us, actually far ahead of us. They actually have these strategies at country level as well as the regional levels. You talk about your EU's uh, countries such as even Canada. But here we are as Africans, we are actually thinking of how do we coalesce and kind of see where do we see our opportunities lying, yet the ship has already sailed. And that is a cause of concern. And when we, if we had managed to successfully implement the Africa mining vision these past 10 years, we would not be in the position where we are, where we are still talking about issues of how have we managed to locate the opportunities that were there as we are mining transitional minerals in terms of maximizing on the opportunities that are going to come with this domestic uh, boom of transitional minerals. And more importantly, I think it's important for us just not to be caught up in terms of the discussion of looking at the opportunities that come with the, uh, with the transition of minerals without also looking at some of the social injustice that have come and that are likely going to come with the continued extraction of especially the transition of minerals. Issues of how the environment has been damaged, where even most of those communities where extraction of minerals have taken place are actually the most vulnerable in terms of our countries, in terms of climate resilience and adaptation. So for me, I think it goes on to the second aspect of your question in a way we're saying, what are the key aspects that should be integral in terms of really addressing the issue of climate financing? We did, we did get insights yesterday that despite um, the agreements, international commitments towards financing of 100 billion uh, per year by those that have been responsible in terms of uh, closing the climate crisis, 
there has been very minimal that has come to developing countries like ours that have not contributed to this crisis. And the issue is, do we continue looking towards uh, those that have contributed to this discourse or we c create solutions for ourselves? And what better industry and what better sector does the extractive industry provide in terms of solutions to ensure that we collect and maximize on the revenue collection and management of these revenue towards addressing, addressing issues of adaptation mainly beyond just looking at climate smart mitigation technologies. And I think that's something that's critical because I think when we look at the current shocks in terms of the droughts and the floods that have really hit a region like where I'm coming from, Southern Africa, and with being a resource-rich uh, area, it really becomes a cause of concern that how our governments or how is this sector really helping in terms of really ensuring that our people are safeguarded in terms of these shocks and resilience in terms of what they are facing. And in so doing, it's important for us to go back to the drawing board and look back at what the options that are being uh, proffered in terms of this meeting and even the Africa Mining Vision because it does provide a wide extensive of policy options that are integral in terms of maximizing on domestic mobilization. So on this end, I'll stop for here, uh, Enea. Thank you so much. Veronica, thank you so much. Um, such, such an encyclopedia of, of, of information, it's, um, it's, uh, you can listen to her all day. Um, thank you so much. You raised so many pertinent issues, um, some of which have been touched on earlier uh, in this conference. But also, I like the questions that you have posed. I think those are really important questions for us to think about further, even beyond this conference, for our policymakers to think about. Um, for example, yes, there are opportunities, but there are also Potential traps, I think that is fair um, because you are having a war or a contest over natural resources and usually it's not as straightforward as it looks as we have all learned from the many decades um, of uh, a lot of our countries exploiting natural resources, whether it's in mining, it's forest. Um, Veronica, you also speak about something really important which is the social cost and to be fair, this is something that probably we haven't uh, discussed extensively in this conference so far, but something really important to also think about. It's not just a prospect for increased tax revenue for your uh, financing of development, but can you also think about the social cost of doing that on people, uh, on the environment? Really, really important points that you have raised for us there. Um, strategies are being formulated. Uh, Ghana launched its uh, strategy recently on this, on this issue. Um, the FDB we've heard from Fred is thinking about supporting countries with a homegrown green uh, strategy. Zambia is in the process of coming up with a green growth strategy. As we do that, what can we learn from this really good blueprint, if I can call it that, in the AMV that we are now gone on another path of coming up with strategies. I was having a chat with a colleague, Glenn Moore, from uh, Zimbabwe during, uh, just before lunch, and he was talking to me, almost lamenting about the implementation gap. So how do we also focus on the implementation gap, which is not just a factor of the absence of strategies? Um, to bring us to the Southern Africa region, I'm going to turn to Darlington um, Muyambwa, um, the Southern Africa Resource Watch Governance Communications and Advocacy Expert with 13 years experience in health governance, youth participation, natural resource governance. Um, he has operated in at country and regional level. I remember some time back him coming from a different country within the region uh, to support my organization to develop a strategy in extractives. So uh, really a good wealth of experience and understanding of these issues in the region. Worked in the UN agencies, international organizations, Local organizations, uh, I need I say more, I think I'll end there and allow him to come in um, in terms of tapping into the wealth of research that you have also conducted, like IGF, uh, on, on, on this and similar issues. Um, just before lunch, we were looking at your recent research, looking at the step that DRC and Congo are saying they have boldly taken to position themselves to tap into this um, boom. Okay, Veronica will call it a boom for now, <laughs> um, uh, if this boom. And so uh, tell us um, uh, in the context of lessons from these um, countries, what lessons can we learn on the path that Zambia and DRC um, are taking? Uh, and also um, how can SADC leverage its mineral resource for climate financing uh, without necessarily um, pursuing and giving us a good lesson of how to 
um, to do the same thing of going on a dirty path um, to development. Th thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, good afternoon uh, once again. It's, it's difficult to speak last after such a panel uh, that would have detailed, but the good thing is everyone is now praying for me, for wisdom. I see a number of people praying for me, so thank you. Um, the wisdom is received. Um, I think key lessons for us, number one, is the issue of harmonizing policies. I think as Africa, we need to to be very clear of an Africa united around the way that we manage our natural resources and more specifically the critical minerals. More than ever now, I think we need to, to come together as Africa and harmonize our policies. Uh, Zambia and DRC are doing exactly that and I think that's the path that more African countries need to follow. So integration is not just going to happen. It has to be deliberate. It has to be driven by policies that the countries uh, make. Uh, number two, I think, uh, an area which is critical is the issue of um, uh, really understanding uh, and having geological information and credible cadastral systems that give us the accurate information around the quanta quantum quality of our natural resources so that we plan not just for immediate extraction, but we plan for uh, future extraction and have solid long-term plans. And I think Zambia and DRC are also making efforts of ensuring that they have got credible information around the resources that they have. And in, in, in so doing, we'll be able to even renegotiate some of the contracts that we are in. And I think you remember our earlier conversation was that although we have critical minerals like cobalt and copper in the case of DRC and Zambia. Most of it has already been sold to other countries. So we need to explore new um, uh, resources, but more importantly, look at renegotiating. And renegotiating will only become possible if we do it at a regional level, not as individual countries. Because as individual countries, you'd know the phenomenon of race to the bottom, right? Where we outcompete each other to get the best deal whilst not knowing that we are getting the worst deal at the end of the day. But if we negotiate, and this I think is the role that SADAC and other uh, institutions like SADAC play, can play to, to ensure that there is harmonization uh, from uh, negotiating of contracts, but more importantly also for at the point of marketing. So I think uh, Zambia and, and DRC also have an opportunity of ensuring that when they do the cobalt marketing, they are doing it in a cooperation so that they are not out marketing sort of each other, but they are doing so jointly with the joint interest of getting uh, the most out of the resources. Uh, I also think there is need for, for us to learn from, from Zambia and DRC in the need for coming up with uh, bilateral linkages of investment funds so that we see more, you know, locally based uh, players such as your artisanal and small scale mining taking an active role in the mining of these critical minerals. Because uh, in most instances, investments is always foreign direct investment. So we look elsewhere. So I think in the context of domestic resource mobilization, let's also utilize what we have internally to uh, strengthen the capacity of our own artisanal and small scale mining so that it is also an active player in the mining that will take uh, place. And um, I think the other issue is also of ensuring when we come together, we can create cost-effective export routes. Because exporting uh, products, either raw materials or finished products, remains expensive because of how we are configured as countries. But if we jointly come together and create certain routes that are efficient and effective, we are likely to benefit uh, much more. And I think this is more true to the case of uh, DRC and Zambia. They really need to have um, these routes uh, together so that they maximize. Uh, you asked about um, SADAC, and I think SADAC can leverage on the existence already of the critical minerals, but more importantly, it is about the negotiating, uh, of, of collective negotiating that they can do at that region. So SADAC has to play a leadership role, uh, and SADAC countries have to, be, have to come to the table 
and be part uh, of uh, this, this team that we are talking about. And then we should also not forget about the DRC forest as a, as a huge resource that we have in the region. We need to cost uh, effectively what the carbon sinks in the DRC that are offered by the forest mean to us monetary wise and utilize this money to then invest because it's our domestic resource. So let's not forget about how important the forest is uh, to the issue of climate change. And by reminding ourselves of the importance, we then stand an opportunity of getting uh, massive resources that we can reinvest to our efforts around addressing uh, climate change. And I think uh, just a last point, we, we need to also at the SADAC level remember that they, and I think this has been made, this comment, that mining will still continue. It's not like critical minerals are going to be magic bullet for us. So we need to still know that mining is going to continue and we need to do our mining better. We need to do it better by coming together and uh, ensure that our competitive and comparative advantage are well taken note of as a region. That way we will not only benefit from the mining of critical minerals but also mining of uh, you know, the development minerals that we have mined for so long. So we need to reconfigure and chart a better way of mining as a region. And then the drive towards decarbonization, where uh, our countries are being demanded, for example, to use less coal uh, in, in the production of electricity. We need to identify this as an opportunity to leverage and say the polluter pays for investments around decarbonization. Ensure that the transition is just so that people don't necessarily lose uh, jobs, so that we don't create ghost towns. So we need then to uh, come on the negotiating table as a region so that we are able to influence much better on the resources that we can get towards the financing of the decarbonization agenda. I will end there. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, um, Darlington, um, for that. Uh, I think that um, my panels deserve another big round of applause. Thank you so much. I mean, excellent points. There are so many of them. I'm struggling to come through and bring out the highlights because I know that um, we have very little time left. I really would like to give you space to also um, intervene and especially starting with the online uh, uh, participants. I don't see Mukasiri and I'm getting concerned uh, if we are attending to our online um, um, participants. Please just assure me that someone is looking uh, out for them, and if there are any questions at this point, I would like to invite them uh, to come in. As, as you do that, whoever is helping us with the online participants, um, I just want to echo this point that you have raised where you have asked us to, you have caused us to think about the other aspects of this resource that DRC and in fact several other countries have in this region, a big issue going on around carbon markets and the money um, and again, there are the issues of social costs coming in terms of who is benefiting uh, from the funds that are being uh, raised from, um, from carbon trading. Uh, is it just governments, is it just corporations, or that money is going into investing and going towards what you are describing as the just uh, transition? So I really like that you have brought up those aspects as well. And about SADC taking a leadership, it has taken a battering um, more often many times as not providing leadership, but you've, uh, I think, emphasized that point quite, um, quite ably as well. So much appreciated those thoughts, Darlington. Thank you so much. Um, any uh, interventions starting from our online audience? Okay, so uh, as, um, there as Cairo is, yeah? There are currently no questions or hands raised online. Okay, thank you for that. I hope that it's not because the discussion was too confusing for them, um, but they were with us. So thank you so much, but if you still want to intervene, know that in the next four to five minutes, you are also uh, entitled to have a say in this conversation. Let's come back to the room. Um, by a show of hands and a quick introduction, Please, you have heard the submissions from our four distinguished speakers. A quick comment or a question from you would be much appreciated, just by a show of hands and uh, the mic will come to you. I see a hand here. Can I see a few more hands so that we can take it as a round? I see another hand. 
from there. So Uchizu, you learn more. Anyone? These are the gentlemen. I see another hand here, a lady. Fantastic. So can we take these four and then see if we can squeeze in one or two and, and, and wrap up? So can we have the mic, uh, the roaming mic, please? Or if you are able to access one on your, uh, on your table, Uchizi, could you begin? Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Darlington, and the panel for your excellent presentations. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question to Darlington uh, regarding renegotiating contracts. I think for Zambia, and I think you also mentioned in, in Congo, uh, the issue of re-evaluating re what we're actually sitting on as Africa in terms of our resources. Um, just in terms of the process of renegotiating, um, wouldn't it be best that we know our position as Africa in terms of what we're sitting on, what our minerals actually mean for us before we go to the negotiating table, or do we go before we actually know what we have? Uh, I just want to know, what, the, in your opinion, what the process would be when it comes to renegotiating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the Lenmo, you are next, and I'll come to you in the front. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Len Moe, as you have said. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. It was an eye-opening, and I think I've learned a lot uh, today. M my question is, um, how best do we balance, I mean, uh, as Africans trying to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emission and the energy poverty? Uh, I'm coming from the point where, like most rural people, they use uh, resources which are considered to be contributing to climate change. And also, uh, the developing countries having developed their industries using the same resources that, that they are discouraging us to use. Uh, isn't it a trap? Uh, uh, if it's not a trap, should we also do what they did first to, to use the, those core? I'm talking of Uganda and Zimbabwe. We recently uh, discovered oil and, and gas and also coal. We use coal in Zimbabwe. And it's a really, really major use. And right now we are having problem of electricity and we are being told to run away, I mean, to stop using coal. So what will be the, what will cover the gap? And is it possible to um, automatically switch from uh, the so-called fossil fuels to the clean energy? Uh, I really need guidance so that when we go back to our leaders, we will advise them properly. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Lenmo, um, for that question. Actually, there are two questions in his submission, please. So uh, I'll come to you, and please, if you can make it brief, would appreciate. Thank you so much. My name is Abetha Piri, and I'm from Malawi Economic Justice Network. My question goes to the online panelists. Many thanks indeed for your um, eye-opening views around the same. My question goes to Mr. Fred Kabanda of ADB. I wanted to understand when he talked about the initiative by ADB to support African countries for the actualization of um, value addition towards uh, critical minerals, to say how deep is that support, basing in, in the understanding that uh, countries need to have the technological know-how and support, as in how the additions would be added to these uh, minerals. He talked about lending out to countries. Um, I just wanted to understand the whole issue of uh, the same support and the understanding that countries also, particularly African countries, are crying hard in terms of uh, the monster, the date itself. And so how, 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 how the support would be like, particularly in the context of uh, technological investments, on the understanding again that countries do export raw materials, even other countries to at that lower level of exporting samples for them to get to know whether we have minerals in these, uh, in these raw materials. How deep is that support? I mean, it's the date issues uh, Thank along the way. Thank you so much, Madam Piri. I think the question was clear. So I will add another one to your submission so that we just uh, wrap up with this round 
of, uh, of questions, but if there is any online, I will take that one as well. So we'll have your submission, sir. And I hear there is another hand to my left. Madam, if you could also uh, please give us your intervention really in, in, under, a minute, in under a minute, we'll appreciate. Please go ahead, sir. Merci. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to take the floor. Allow me to ask just one question. One question on, uh, on the... Là, c'est bon. Voilà. Donc, je dis, à la, euh, je voudrais, à la suite de notre sœur qui a présenté sur la vision minière euh, africaine, euh, parce que je sais qu'au niveau du Cameroun, il y a une étude qui a été effectuée. Parce que vous avez été ici. C'est bon C'est bon C'est bon. Voilà. Je disais que au Cameroun, avec notre ami. We agree with what our colleague. Give me this. If you use this, then it appears they can't see. Okay, please go ahead. Sorry about that. Please go ahead. Yes, can I continue? Actually, or, or, or. please go ahead. Voilà, merci. Thank you, thank you. Uh, saying that um, in Cameroon, a study was undertaken. A study was undertaken in Cameroon by our colleagues from. Uh, uh, they wanted to know the level of uh, the level of this uh, vision that we are talking about in the mining area. Là, c'est bon. Nous vous entendons. Là, c'est bon. Voilà. Merci. Thank you. This doc is this one document. No, no, continue, continue, okay. Continue, okay, it's a document that is very important. This is very for Africa, when, which is not talked about much. And I know that Cameroon, with our friend Gradek Mbalambala, they carried out a study to see the level of the implementation of uh, this uh, mining Africa vision in Cameroon. In, as well as in Senegal. We have to do some work to see how the African Mining Union can be set up in Senegal. I would like to know at your level, beyond, instead of just describing the different pillars in the vision, because the vision has many pillars, did you have to carry out benchmarking on the African level to see the level of uh, setting up of this vision in the African continent, on the African continent. Thank you. Th thank you so much, and apologies for the hiccups earlier. Um, the translation was able to uh, pick your, your submission, so that is the most important thing, and we'll see how to relay that um, um, to the speakers in a moment, especially for the two that are in, uh, with me here. Uh, allow me to take in her question, and then um, we, can, we can wrap up the question. And uh, Please go ahead, madam. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Nancy Abisai, formerly of the East Africa Legislative Assembly. Um, I, I want to thank the panelists for that very enriching engagement. And the only thing that I have one quick question. Uh, Madam, uh, you talked uh, about the need for regional laws and policies that put in place the mining sector. Uh, I think this is a very good uh, proposal 
but I just wanted to know, in terms of uh, even pushing this, would you think that it would also go hand in hand uh, with the opportunities on fiscal reform, and especially maybe thinking about um, environmental uh, policy, fiscal uh, policy, fiscal reform policy, so that we think about increasing taxes and removing subsidies on um, environmentally harmful uh, products. Because I know you even raised a question in your presentation that how many countries are producing solar? We have very many multinationals from outside uh, the continent coming into the continent and putting up solar panels and solar plants for, for, for our countries. But in terms of the natural resources that they are also using and taking from Africa, maybe that is another question that we have to address. Because the rain started beating us because of the abundance of resources in this continent. So maybe just those two aspects. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Madam. And um, I will request that the uh, question in French that was submitted um, be repeated at some point. I will request you to do that for the sake of the panels, uh, the, the panels in front of, uh, of, of this room. So let us start with the first one, um, which is, um, was directed at you, Darlington. Um, this is the question that has to do with the process um, from Uchizi. Please take that question. I hope you, you got it. Kindly take it away. And uh, that is the main question for you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a very important aspect, I think, for African countries to look into. Uh, but as sovereign states, they still have the ability to renegotiate some of the contracts that they've entered into. But in terms of process, I think number one is to know our resource um, quantum quality uh, that we have, uh, both uh, for active minds as well as, you know, for those uh, other prospective uh, minds. The second thing is it is only possible and meaningful if it's done at a regional level. A country by country renegotiation can be disastrous. Because like I said earlier on in the presentation, they will go to country X if Y is stating the, uh, a, you know, uh, provisions that they think are not favorable. So we need to do it collectively, I think, by identifying uh, which countries are leading in what m uh, mineral and do it collectively around that particular cluster of minerals. So if it's platinum, we need to have all platinum uh, producing countries come together and have a single voice around this. If it's cobalt or copper, the same happens. Without that, it becomes very difficult to, 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 to address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darrington, and thank you for keeping it short. Um, I would like to um, have you, Veronica, come in before I go to the online panel. So there is this question from Madame over there in ab about the opportunities, uh, including fiscal reform on the environmental side. So a quick submission, and then we go to the, um, to the online, um, that is Viola and uh, Fred. Veronica, very quickly. Um, I think um, I see that really more of as a comment because um, I, I think the general um, focus mainly for us when we look at um, the mining sector is about really focused mainly on uh, the fiscal narrative, that is the collection of taxes and revenue. And when we look in terms of uh, how many countries have um, gone in terms of um, adapting and um, adapting the Africa mining vision, you find that this is one pillar where a lot of countries have done resoundingly very well. And I think from the past sessions, we do acknowledge this narrative that there have really been some milestones in terms of really uh, fostering the issues of uh, maximizing on revenue. And I think because really that's the impetus in which we can sustain uh, the, the, our, our economies, uh, especially as resource-rich countries, because they are the mainstay of the economy. So a lot of efforts are put there, uh, though there may be loopholes here and there. Um, but the, the general consensus amongst many governments is that that's 
where a lot of concern and a lot of focus is really having in terms of the traction to address ensuring that some of the policy proposals related to uh, the fiscal narrative are garnered and that is actually very impressive. But the Africa Mining Vision looks at the various governance issues related to across the value chain and importantly it covers issues of economic and social issues and it also provides policies and especially regulatory aspects that in any way in some way they can link to fiscal as aspects. So for example in some some uh, ongoing mining legal reforms, you find that a lot of uh, laws are now integrating the issues of environment, even creating environmental funds in terms of their laws, as a way of ensuring that we, at least uh, the governments, can find a way of ensuring that they collect some revenue that can come with some of uh, the challenges that will come to the environment. Because in most cases, whilst um, the laws may actually uh, impose the companies to address issues of uh, rehabilitation and mine closure, in actual sense, that cost usually is borne by the state. And in most cases, the state does not have that capacity. And because it's because of that narrative where those issues of environmental aspects have not really been integrated within the whole fiscal narrative. So it's a development that seems to be ongoing. And there is need to ensure that at least uh, as countries are reforming their laws, they are also cognizant that beyond just looking at uh, the lifespan of the mine where it's really uh, in terms of the production, there is also other important aspects that come with regards to uh, issues of environmental uh, closure and uh, rehabilitation. Then Lenmo did also take us talk about the issues of um, the dilemma of um, uh, the energy transition of reducing the grand greenhouse gas emissions as well as um, addressing our energy poverty is, is Africa. And I think those are, that's a very important narrative, especially uh, as we're going to COP27, where we, as African governments, I think it's very important to, 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 to see how we can place this whole discussion around the contextualities of our continent, whereby I think we, when you look at developing countries, they have been on the industrialization end, and their efforts are towards how do we then reduce, because they have been the biggest culprit in terms of the emission. But for us, I think, Frank, as you started the session, you mentioned that we're only contributing 3% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So in terms of the energy transition, where are we transitioning? From where to what? Again, it's a certain percentage way, oh, but 97% is born by other actors behind Africa. And I think that narrative should be something that should also be clear and something that I think as civil society we need to also pull together in terms of that messaging uh, with our government that there should be a just energy transition that is based on common but differentiated responsibilities. The energy transition is a reality, and we will conform, but I think there have been contextualities that have to be put in place in terms of what our contributions have been, what our development trajectory is, especially addressing issues of energy poverty, including aspects related to uh, fossil fuels. But the reality is, for me, I think what's practical is that we need to move towards renewables. And a plan should be in place in terms of how are we going to gradually phase out the fossil fuels towards renewables because we all have that collective responsibility in terms of Paris Agreement to reduce any activities that contribute towards um, emission, higher emissions. So it's, it's, it's a responsibility that we have to bear, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it also has to be located within our realities. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, Veronica. And uh, we are wrapping up now. Um, before we come to you, uh, Fred, uh, please get ready for the question from uh, Madam P from Marawi. Uh, regarding the, 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 the support, particularly ar around technological investments. Um, we had a small glitch around the translation again, and this time uh, I think the option we have is that the translators will help us um, to repeat the question, this time in English for the sake of the audience and my panelists here. So kindly go ahead, our, um, our, our, our interpreters, with repeating the question in French. In English. The question that was asked is, uh, do you have, have you revised texts in the various countries to know if the Vision Mining Africa is applied in other African countries? Has this vision been implemented in other African countries? Yeah, you got it. Uh, it's, 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 it's very close to an implementation issue. Um, to some extent, if I'm reading uh, his, his, his question correctly, do we have good examples of implementation and application of the Africa mining vision? 
so that we are referring to those examples. Okay, he's given me an affirmative. So I think that is um, for you, um, Veronica. So really quickly, so that yeah. we move to Fred and wrap up. Yeah, quickly, I think um, I did mention that um, most countries, when we look at in terms of how they have managed to um, domesticate some of the tenants of the African region, a lot of strides or a lot of countries have mainly focused on the revenue uh, collection and, and management uh, aspects. So there's been a lot of traction in terms of uh, uh, domesticating uh, the regulator and uh, policy, for, uh, policy narratives or options that are being offered uh, within the Africa mining vision. But in terms of issues, for example, in the awarding of mining contracts, a lot are not really full. They still... Um, non-compliance in terms of the competitive awarding of mining rights, issues of contract transparency, those are some of the nuggets in terms of the various facets. But I think safely we can say in terms of domestic resource mobilization on fiscal issues, I think that has been a great attraction where most of them have been seen. Thank you so much, Veronica. Uh, Fred, there is a question that was posed to you. I'm sure you took note of it. I repeated on the, uh, the extent of support, particularly on the technological um, uh, uh, investment. Please, really quickly, under a minute, and then we, we wrap up. Over to you, Fred. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, uh, the lady who asked this from Malawi. Um, basically, you were asking um, to what details or what depth do you go in supporting value addition? And I would just like to highlight that the African Development Bank has two main arms the lending arm, but also the knowledge arm. The knowledge uh, informs the lending. And so before we go into lending operations, we uh, normally undertake uh, studies that inform the lending. And so for value addition, what we have done so far in the case of DR Congo and uh, Zambia is to analyze what are these opportunities that currently exist that could be uh, low-hanging fruits. And we undertook this study and found that Indeed, the technology is lacking because it has proprietary rights. It has rights by the owners. And so what we have done is to link the technological owners to uh, the government uh, in the region to look at how can they maximize this? How can they not reinvent the wheel by going into R&D to make new technologies? And how can they use that is the one that's existing? Secondly, we also looked at how can we start gradually? And there was a study, therefore, on the opportunities that come with the two wheelers, the motorcycles, and the three wheelers, which are more common in Africa than elsewhere before going into electric vehicles. We have also done some work lately on uh, energy storage for uh, lending the private sector, where we are lending to ESCOM in order to transition as they go from coal into the aspects of uh, renewable energies which need storage, and therefore, together with the World Bank, we have given loans to the private sector. Two, uh, uh, basically, I would really like to clarify that the African Development Bank is owned by all the 54 countries of Africa. Interest rates are very low, but the lending is prioritized by the country. Uh, we give up to 1% of interest rate, but the countries choose which year, what, what loans they will take in a year, and it varies from year to year going forward. So I hope I have in one minute. Yes, you I have. Yes, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much, Fred, and, 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 and thank you so much for the, for, for I know you might have wanted to add a lot more, but we are really over time now. Um, I would like to, I know that we are way over time, but Viola, um, if you have any really, really quick burning issue that you want to add, please go ahead. Very, very quick submission. Uh, we won't even have time to summarize, but please just say something in case you want to make a submission. Viola? Thank you so much, Anaya. A very interesting discussion. Maybe my key takeaway point from this discussion has been that energy transition is happening. We need to be ready for that. We need to take stock of how we have been taxing the mining sector in terms of the design, but also in the administration um, of revenue collection. It's important to note that we, in the mining sector, we use a lot of royalties and corporate income tax to tax the sector. 
but um, the corporate income tax, we've not gotten to collect revenues from corporate income tax. But on the other hand, there are countries that we could look at within Africa that are now piloting solutions on how to increase the benefits from the mining sector. Countries like Botswana, where we have a strong state participation. We are looking at countries like Uganda that are now um, currently looking at having production sharing contracts within the mining sector. So it's not about corporate income tax, but sharing the actual production. We also see countries that have variable royalties within Africa where we can learn from South Africa, Mauritania, where the royalties increase with the prices of these critical minerals. My point is there's a lot, a lot so much that we could learn from the African continent. Conversations on environmental and carbon taxes. South Africa is the only African country with a carbon tax and there's so much to learn from them. So the solutions are within us. We don't have to look far to be able to benefit from the extractive sector. Thank you so much. Viola, thank you very much um, for that submission and uh, helping us to really wrap up and look at the opportunities and move forward. Um, ladies and gentlemen, for me, it has been an absolute pleasure um, to have this panel. Um, uh, Veronica from Oxfam, uh, Viola IGF, uh, Fred from the African Development Bank, and Darlington from the Southern Africa Resource Watch. Uh, join me in giving a final round of applause and to yourselves. And thank you for being an engaging audience. It's not the easiest thing to do after two days of intense conversations, but I hope that we have picked some points that are worth adding into what uh, TJNA is taking forward when it comes to this important uh, conversation in terms of uh, domestic resource mobilization and uh, climate change. I, I will now hand over to uh, Frank, our main moderator, to carry us forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Enea. That was really um, an exciting panel. Uh, we really saved the best for last. So can we please give them another powerful round of applause? <laughs> Great. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are drawing closer to the end of uh, the 10th park. So we have had rich conversations and we are also happy to see that the audience was also um, very active, which is very good, because that also made the conversations really rich. But it shouldn't just end here. In fact, this is the beginning. And uh, as we have always been saying for the past few days, implementation, implementation, implementation. So we would like to hear the success stories at the next 11th pack. We would like to hear to say, hey, we are trying to, sh we would like to share with you the success stories. So let this be the beginning, not the end. It shouldn't just end here. So at this juncture, we will now proceed into the closing session of the Pan-African Conference, the 10th Pan-African Conference. They say, all good things must come to an end. I know you'd have preferred to stay here and then enjoy, and still enjoy these conversations. So, I will invite to the uh, to the front um, several high-level uh, delegates so that they can just give us a few reflections of the past few days of the conference, and thereafter we shall have the outcome statement being read. So the first person I would like to call in front is Mr. Isaac Maipopo, who is the director of the CTPD. Mr. Maipopo, please come in front. Thank you. Secondly, I would like to call Mrs. Mary Baine. Um, she is the deputy executive secretary, as well as the head of the domestic resource mobilization and member service at the African Tax Administration Forum, ATAF. The third person I would like to call in front is Mr. Um, Arvin Mosioma, who is the founding, direct, uh, the founding executive director of the Tax 
Justice Network Africa. So, ladies and gentlemen, I know uh, most of us, when we were coming here, we took a flight. And in almost all flights, you usually have two pilots. Um, so, we also have pilots in this conference. My expertise was taking off and autopilot. But we have another expert who is very good at landing, so that we can have a safe and smooth landing. So, I would like to call in front Mukupa, who is from TJNA, she will now take us uh, through um, um, uh, the rest of the closing session, more especially to handle the outcome statement as well. And then she will also share with us the logistics, because as you recall, we have got a birthday party coming up uh, later this evening. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mukupa. Thank you so much, Frank. I think he's done an excellent job. So well done, Frank. So this is supposed to be a very short conversation or closing. We are all very tired, so we won't take much of your time. So I'm going to join um, the team down there to just um, hear from them on what their key takeaways have been, what next for PAC. It's been the 10th PAC we've celebrated, but we also want to know what the action is going forward. So I'll speak to our three distinguished panelists. Okay, so um, Alvin, Mary, Isaac, welcome to this final closing session. So it's going to be a very conversational one. We don't want another heavy panel, um, and we don't want to keep our delegates longer than expected. So I'll start with you, Isaac. This has been the 10th pack. We've come for the past two days. We've deliberated. We've heard different conversations around the political economy, international financial architecture, and so on and so forth. How do you feel about this pack? And what would you say has been, have we met our expectations in terms of what we set out to meet uh, at this pack? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mukupa. I think I'll begin by saying we feel highly fulfilled. I think it took quite a lot to convince Alvin uh, to bring the pack to Zambia and uh, looking at the way the event has uh, turned out from the Center for Trade Policy and Development. We feel fulfilled in the sense that uh, it has given an opportunity to a lot of uh, actors, especially in the country, as well as outside, an opportunity to interface with uh, various experts that have been weighing in on issues related to taxation. So looking at the audience as well, I should also make mention that this pack was oversubscribed. We had a lot of people that wanted to come through and be part of uh, this conference. Uh, we had some of our colleagues that experienced some technicalities in terms of their travel logistics, but the level of commitment that was demonstrated to still make it even after a day of the conference uh, deserves a lot of uh, commendation and uh, just a clap of encouragement to all that managed to make it. Uh, but other than that, I think this uh, park has also given us a very good opportunity to interface on a number of challenges that African countries are facing. Uh, real experiences have been shared in terms of what countries are doing to resolve some of the challenges. Uh, we've learned practical examples on how countries are losing uh, a lot of uh, resources as a result of uh, initiatives such as uh, the provision of tax incentives. Uh, we have also picked from other countries that have uh, uh, taken up steps in closing up some of the loopholes and as a result uh, they've ended up uh, uh, realizing some revenues. And some of the measures that have been shared within this uh, conference are speaking to legal processes that some countries have uh, been undertaking. It's encouraging to see that some African governments are going a step as further as uh, uh, litigation to just try and ensure that uh, uh, resources that are supposed to benefit their people are actually realized. Uh, these are some of uh, my key takeaways from this conference, of course, beyond the networking and opportunities that it will offer beyond the gathering. Thank you, Isaac, and thank you for being an amazing host, all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Over to you, Mary. Um, Tenth Park, how do you feel? What next for ATAF? Especially that we know you have an exciting decade ahead. So how do you feel about this park and looking at your vision going forward? What do you see um, in terms of taking forward the action points that have been raised from here? Thank you so much. I think it's working now. Thank you so much, Mukupa. And um, I want to say that for me, the last two days have been very, very different from the other meetings that I've been to lately. They've been extremely interesting. Because when you live in a world like ours, where you talk about tax every day of your life, and you talk about IFFs all, all the time, you get to a point and you think that you're the, you're, it's a lonely journey, that you're doing this alone. But it was really interesting to listen to the different discussions, the, uh, the experiences that were shared, the ideas that were provided, especially in terms of dealing with illicit financial flows, and, and the knowledge that people have especially on the global tax reforms, and how countries should position themselves and how the continent should position itself in terms of getting what is fit for purpose in Africa. So for me, it was really successful. Secondly, the attendance and the varied areas that people come from. It was really well attended. Yes, I was talking about the attendance. It was also very, very well attended. And um, I liked that we weren't only talking about tax administration. I liked that we concentrated on policy. And I liked the fact that there were very strong ideas on how everybody is going to advocate, especially for um, the social contract and the commitments that were made by the various players in terms of implementing the recommendations on illicit financial flows. And of course, uh, the general networking was really, really good and partnering with TJNA and uh, uh, my brother here, it was really, really good. So for me, the expectations were made on a scale of 1 to 10, I think. Once we have a scale again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, I think I would give a 9 and that deserves an applause. <laughs> That wasn't the same question. <laughs> I start with how much we are grading ourselves. Um, I give ourselves a 12. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, so let me start. I think that there were there are a few um, logistical things that didn't work well. Some um, unexpected, like the travel that Isaac mentioned. I think another thing for me, I was having some conversation with colleagues over lunch just to get a sense of how they felt. I think one key lesson as organizers, we take forward is that we need to be more deliberate and conscious about our Francophone or French-speaking colleagues. And for that, I, um, we as DGNA, and as I'm speaking on behalf of ETA, we take responsibility um, for any challenges that came in. Um, we understand the challenge, but particularly in terms of the diversity of the speakers, but also the challenge that came in. Um, with translation. So we, we hear you and we promise to do better next time on this particular area. I'm speaking this to Sandra and other um, uh, colleagues that uh, uh, French is their, their main language. Um, so they did meet our expectations. Um, largely yes, um, and I can speak I can speak a few, few points. Uh, I was in the, the last session I was in was the ETAF um, um, automatic exchange of information and two things that I took away from that. One, and I tweeted it today, that the Kenya Revenue Authority managed to collect a million dollars as a result of implementing automatic exchange of information and a frame that was used there was, what was that, jealousy, um, useful jealousy? useful jealousy, which was they said we saw our Ugandan colleagues what they were doing and we were very jealous and we used those lessons to implement uh, similar measures and, and, and this is what we managed to do. That's a very concrete outcome which I think for me a key, a key takeaway. The other was the colleague, the same uh, colleague from my, uh, KRA, um, Joyce, who made reference to uh, 
uh, the suit. We know we sued as TJNA, we sued the, the government, the Kenya Revenue Authority and the Minister of Finance for lack of participation in policy making. And there was a long, long litigation exercise. So when she started speaking of that, I was a little bit nervous. But then when we followed up, she said this has been really, really useful because as a result of that litigation, although the process of uh, implementing some of these policies is tedious and long because you have to involve the public, it has on the other side been a very useful process because it has broadened the perspectives and ensured that they are doing their work, thorough work, before they, they push particular policies. For me, that particular session was um, something very, like a key takeaway in general. But speaking of uh, four key things that I think for me generally over the conference were, were important. Um, one is the point about implementation. Implementation, implementation. And I think uh, Frank spoke to this also, that we know what the solutions are, but the political will to implement those solutions is what is lacking. So how do we actually work on that? That's probably, you know, we need a full conference on how do you manufacture political will. Uh, be it on the area of, of the Africa mining vision, there are number the, uh, the CFTA, there are all these kind of blueprints that the continent has, very progressive, but we are struggling when it comes to implementation. That's the first. The second um, are the points that were made earlier by the, the speakers, Charles and Titus uh, and, and others, about the interconnectedness of the struggles. Uh, yes, we might talk, be talking here about illicit financial flows and taxation, but this is connected to issues around debt. Uh, this is connected to issues of um, climate change. It's connected to the issues on trade. And the need to have that perspective and connecting the dots is important so that we are not working on a siloed uh, uh, way in terms of the solutions that, uh, that we propose. And for me, a lesson to take out of that, maybe we then have to deliberate that the next conference uh, if there's a forward-looking if there's a forward-looking idea, is to frame the next conference not on illicit financial flows, but on development finance, because of how these issues uh, are connected. So next, next, next year when we invite you, don't be surprised if the conference is not really reading the Pan-Africa Conference on Illicit Financial Flows, but the Pan-Africa Conference on Development Finance, where illicit financial flows is a major component, but also looking at other interconnected issues that are, that are equally critical. And the two last points are, um, is, I think, the, the, the importance or the urgency and the importance of state capacity. And I think it's tight as we spoke that, that we can have all these kind of progressive um, um, ideas, but if we don't invest in building the state capacity to implement those uh, policies, invest in test capacity to actually action and respond to some of these crises, then we will be here, conference after conference, discussing. And how do we do that? Tax is a major, major actor, a major, major important um, player in terms of building or strengthening state capacity through revenues. Uh, and, and lastly, um, with your permission, is this African agency. Um, and I think I spoke to that, that the Stop the Bleeding campaign motto says, Sis in your tuku. It is us who are there. When the kids were singing here, um, and I saw some of few people here, I'm not going to mention names, I saw a few um, um, uh, tears dropping. Because the work that we are doing here is not just for us, it's for the generations to come. And that responsibility rests with us. The responsibility of solving the challenges that we face is not going to come from anywhere but from the people in this room. Um, this is our responsibility. It is us who are there. Um, we need to, um, if you imagine the Titanic, we shouldn't be relying on the life buoys of external. We need to build our own boats if we are to withstand uh, the storm. Uh, those are for me the key salient issues that I pick over the conversation of the last three days. Thank you uh, to the three of you. Maybe in closing, I just want you to speak to one key action that you commit to taking forward uh, from the PAC for your organizations. In one minute, one key action, so that we can hold you accountable at the next PAC. 
Well, there are quite a number of key actions we can take, but in terms of isolating one, uh, first of all, we feel very happy from the Center for Trade Policy and Development that we had the Zambia Revenue Authority uh, here to just share on some of the steps that they are taking with regards to tackling illicit financial flaws. We also had the Ministry of Finance. This is despite the fact that there is a big event tomorrow where the Minister will be presenting the national budget. That was a good sign in terms of commitment. In terms of taking forward, I think it's an aspect of positioning ourselves to provide more support to our institutions like the Zambia Revenue Authority. And that support can come through research. There are a number of studies that have been done by a number of institutions here, including ATAF, uh, uh, Tax Justice Network Africa, and riding on some of those recommendations, progressive ideas, then get to advance uh, further recommendations to ensure that all loopholes ultimately get to be addressed. And uh, we have a situation where our development is largely financed by uh, local resources. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Mary? Thanks again, Mokupa. Uh, it's a very difficult choice for me because I have at least eight. <laughs> but I'll just stick to one that, is, that was really revealing again in the breakaway uh, session that we had on automatic exchange of information, where one of the speakers talked about the fact that uh, ATAF is trying to build capacity on taxation, and uh, ATAF has not engaged civil society, and yet civil society largely engages the different players at, at policy level, the different arms of government. So that is one of the takeaways. We're going to see how to, we can up our game in terms of engaging other stakeholders other than just the tax authority and ministries of finance. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Alvin? Well, uh, and you will hold us accountable to that, you say. Yes. So I, I think what we, we probably have not created enough space in this conversation is the space to track progress. We, we have so much focused on problem analysis, but celebrating the wins that we are making. I think we have not created enough space, and there has been some kind of anecdotal stories so what we can commit uh, as TGNA is to be more deliberate in the next conference, to actually track progress, to be able to provide some level of analysis of where are we actually, where, and some I think the colleague from Senegal asked that question, the colleague from Cameroon asked that question, do we have best practice, do we have good examples, because we need to celebrate also the great things that are happening in these spaces, and we need to be more deliberate, and that's what TGNA uh, commits to in the next uh, uh, Pan African Conference. Thank you uh, to, to you all. Um, ladies and gentlemen, help me in thanking Alvin, Mary, and Isaac uh, for the closing session. You may take your seat and remember to hold them accountable next year. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. So we will proceed to the final, final closing. Um, after I am done, I'll ask uh, Honorable Shabalala to prepare herself to come and read the outcome statement and get us uh, fired up for action as we exit the room. But before that, there are a few announcements that I need to make. Okay, so I guess I can use this. Um, the first is concerning TJNA at 15. So we have a party to celebrate TJNA. TJNA now is a full-fledged teenager <laughs> at 15. So we have a party by the poolside here at the Taj Pamozi. So please come in your African attire. That's the theme, I think. African culture and uh, African uh, regalia. So please come in your African attire. And we look forward to seeing you there at 6 p.m. Um, right by the poolside. Then for those that book to do their PCR tests, we have a doctor at the reception now who's waiting to conduct your test, so please carry your passports as well as your flight details so that the test can be done and the certificate generated. Then also to ensure that we have a smooth exit tomorrow, please ensure that we clear all our bills. This is a logistics announcement I was asked to make so that then we don't delay the shuttle process to the airport. And then one last time again, just to say a big, big thank you to all our uh, speakers, co-conveners, 
and all of us here that came to attend. I think you've been an excellent audience, and I ask that we give ourselves a big round of applause. So thank you. I'll ask Honorable Shalala to please come forward and read us the outcome statement. You will all get a copy of this outcome statement, basic, basically summarizing all the key things that we've discussed, but also for our French uh, colleagues, we promise to email it to you as soon as we translate it um, so that we have it in different versions as well as Portuguese. So please welcome, help me welcome Dr. Shavalala. Thank you very much, Mukupa. Um, this is an outcome statement that we have all committed to. So somewhere at the end, I will ask you to stand for it so that I know that you accept it. But for now, you can listen to it seated. The Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Tax 2022 Outcome Statement, we commit to the following. The 10th PAC this year was brought together by CSOs, media, government, representatives, individual researchers, and members of parliament from over 21 countries across the world under the theme, tax justice amid multiple crises. We are aware that the African continent is facing multiple crises of debt distress, climate emergence, conflict, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, Addressing the crises requires urgent and effective policy changes in social and economic policies and enhanced domestic resource mobilization. This can never be achieved if we continue to work in silos or what is called single issue. The synergy and the policy capacity needed to mobilize for these changes and generate the political will to implement them makes it imperative that we align our analysis and coordinate our advocacy campaigns. There is no partial or one-issue solution to the multiple crises. All aspects of the crises need to be approached comprehensively and addressed simultaneously. The need for agency, convergence and cohesion should underline our common struggle. We are cognizant that the impact of illicit financial flows is felt and lived at country level. However, while domestic measures to tackle illicit financial flows are important, they can never adequately curb IFFs. They require sub-regional and continental cooperation as well as coordination of efforts to fight against structural and governance um, impediments and for changes in the global financial and economic architect. We are aware that while developed countries are the main destinations of IFFs, the real beneficiaries are a minority but very influential. Multinational corporations and wealthy individuals from around the globe. We recognize that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement's implementation offers opportunities to promote value retention within the continent and subsequently fostering an enabling environment to strengthen Africa's contribution to curb illicit financial flows. We are cognizant that the development of policy and fostering change at national, sub-regional, continental and global level is a question of changing the unequal power relationships between and within countries. Based on deliberations during the duration of the 10th Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Tax, we commit to do the following. One, foster mutual understanding and greater collaboration among civil society, government institutions, and academic institutions at the national, sub-regional, continental, and global south, as well as globally on policy reform priorities for combating illicit financial flows. IFFs affect us all. Stakeholders must therefore combat them collaboratively. Two, work towards the multiple-dimensional approach that tax justice requires 
for successful domestic resource mobilization, taking cognizance of debt, climate crisis, regionalization, tra trade, pr trade production, technology and investment. This will require us to leverage and harness relationships within regional bodies such as the African Union and harmonize efforts to curb IFFs. Three, continually track and publish progress on measures taken to address illicit financial flows at national, regional, and continental level. This will facilitate transparency, public debate, and public oversight and scrutiny. Four, deliberately create opportunities such as the Pan-African Conference for deeper thought and reflection on strategies to tackle illicit financial flows, enhance reforms of our taxation systems, and ultimately show up domestic resource mobilization on the continent. Five, foster South-to-South -South solidarity and make it the basis for global coalitions, for generating the political momentum that will be required to reform the inequitable global financial architecture. Take key steps to achieve a new Southern consensus on tackling IFFs. Six, work closely with stakeholders involved in the implementation of the African Continental Trade Agreement to promote tax justice, including those dealing with climate financing, security and peace, and across the whole human rights spectrum including the majority in the Global South, who are victims of inequalities created by IFFs. Seven, advocate for greater reforms of the global financial architecture, including a, UK, a UN tax convention and a UN tax body to lead in global tax reforms to provide an inclusive and equitable participation of all countries. So, now that you have heard what we agreed upon, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Now that we, oh God, I was given a big voice. Sorry for those from whom I took. Now that we have heard what we all agreed upon, we are all going to stand. This is called the photo moment. Do we want an 11th Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Tax? Do we? I am not hearing yes or no. So, Alvin, maybe we must stop. Do we want the next conference, the 11th one? You do? Okay. Now, this is the part where I say, look alive. This is the moment for the people who must fund that conference. So, let us look alive. Can we all stand, please? Long live the spirit of the Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Tax. Long, Long live. Long live the spirit of the Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Tax. Long, Long live. Long live the spirit of the 10th PAC. Long live. Long live the spirit of the action points emanating from the 10th PAC. Long live. Forward to the 11th conference on illicit financial flows and tax where we share best practices and action points forward. forward. Forward to an action point sharing and best practice sharing 11th Pan-African Conference on Illicit Financial Flows and Tax. Forward. forward. Long live Africa. Long live. Long live, long live Africa. Long live. Long live. Forward to a Pan-African based one just equitable transparent tax law in Africa. Forward. Forward to an African based one just tax law in Africa. Forward. Forward, forward to the Africa mining vision. Forward. Forward, forward to a Pan African based one uh, mineral resource governance policy in Africa emanating from the African mining vision. Forward. forward. Long live Center for Trade Policy and Development. Long live. Long live CTDP, long live. long live. 
Long live African Tax Administration Forum. Long live. Long live. Long live. Ataf. Long live. Long live. Ataf. 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 Long live. Long live. Tax Justice Network Africa. Long live. Long live the spirit of the Pan-African promoting and African unity promoting leadership at Tax Justice Network Africa. Long live. Long live. Uh, uh, don't be jealous if your organizations are not doing it. <laughs> Long live the Pan-African promoting and African unity promoting leadership spirit of Tax Justice Network Africa. Long live. Long live TJNA, 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 long live. Now, you know they are turning 15. So we're gonna, I know you guys like that music, I don't. So we're gonna tweet the Ama Piano style. Oh, you love it, I don't. So now, I'm going to say happy birthday TJNA and you guys are going to say Ala la TJ and ala la. Ne? Ala la just means or any good thing when you congratulate somebody. <laughs> happy birthday, TJ. Happy birthday. Happy la la. Happy birthday, TJ. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Ala la. You see, the young people ala surpass ala. all of you, they know this. Happy birthday, TJNA. Happy birthday. Ala la. Ala la, TJNA. Ala la. Happy birthday, TJNA. Happy birthday. Ala la, TJNA. Ala la. Happy birthday, TJNA. Happy birthday. Now, we're going to see who will be admitted as a VIP guest this evening. Boy. It will depend if you can scream the loudest, shout the loudest, look happy the loudest. <laughs> that? So now we are going to drag the ala ala. Ne? So now I'm going to say ala ala, 15th birthday, TJNA, ala ala. And you guys, that's your last ala ala. After this, we are going. And you are going to shout and drag it ala ala, TJNA, ala ala. <laughs> Ala la 15th birthday TJNA ala la ala la TJNA ala la happy birthday TJNA so we can sing them a song we can do it in style and sing it in a local language it just means grow more and more o kule kule O kule kule, o kule tije ne, o kule kule. Once more, we do want them to grow. O kule kule, o kule kule, o kule tije ne. Amanda. Thank you, thank you so much, Honorable Shawala. Let's give her a big clap, please. Okay, you may take your seats. <laughs> you may take your seats. One more announcement. So, the shuttles will be at your hotel um, at 5.45 to pick you up to come back to uh, the poolside. So, you're going to leave now to go to the hotels, those who are not staying here. And then you'll be picked up again at 5.45. Then we have little gifts and presents. We should be getting gifts from you as TJ. <laughs> but no, there's some little goodies as you exit. So please carry a bag and a notebook by the registration desk, which we prepared for you. And lastly, the interpretation team has misplaced about eight um, headsets. So if by any chance you carry them to your room, please just do leave them in your room or contact any of us any of us if you accidentally carry them to your room i emphasize accidentally <laughs> please do uh, pass them on to one of us uh, or leave them in your room thank you so much see you at 6 p.m <laughs> Keep
PC artist.